Good evening, everyone. We're going to call together tonight's meeting of the City of South Pasadena Mobility and Transportation Infrastructure Commission, regular meeting for Tuesday, August 20th, 2024. Uh, Danielle, would you like to call the roll, please? Thank you, Chair. I will now commence roll call. Commissioner Hammond? Here. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Commissioner Dunlap? Here. Chair Hughes? Here. Uh, and Council Liaison Simer? Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. Our next order will be the Pledge of Allegiance, led by our Commissioner Dunlap, if you please. Please stand if you're able. Again, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner. Our next item will be public comment. And Danielle, do we have any public comment? cards or requests. Thank you, Chair. As Chair Hughes shared, we will now open public comment that will be made on Zoom. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand. Chair Hughes, we have no public comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Zoom. I'm trying to hear you. Thank you. Um, I will make note for the record that we did receive um, correspondence via email from a number of entities. So for the record, we do have uh, those comments. Um, next order will be presentation. Welcome uh, Director Gerber will be sharing with us the presentation regarding Marengo Avenue. Good evening, Ted. Um, good evening, commissioners. Uh, before I begin, um, I was going to mention this during my uh, staff liaison comments, um, but we did have uh, Commissioner uh, Zavala did step away from the commission. So we have a vacancy. We'll be looking to fill that. Um, he is uh, pursuing uh, other events in life. I'll, I'll see what he wants to share with you, but uh, that's why he was not here tonight, so. A point of order, do we need to, for the next agenda meeting, put on whether we need to elect another co-chair? Um, yes, we should probably do that at the next agenda meeting. That'd be okay. a good idea. Um, the alternative would be to wait until uh, another member is added to the group and then consider that again, we could, if you want to do that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so our, the significant item on the agenda tonight is about the Marengo, Ave Marengo Avenue safety assessment. Um, this has been on our work plan for the last fiscal year. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this came about after the city council and MTech received uh, many public comments and concerns about traffic speeding, um, drivers ignoring signage on Marengo Avenue. Uh, and so in the process of developing this safety assessment, um, our staff worked with one of our um, on-call consultants and have also been in communication with some of the residents on Marengo Avenue. Um, we have some of the um, membership from the Marengo Matters group in the audience tonight, and we've been engaging with them for some time. And so the scope components were developed um, in hearing what the concerns were in that neighborhood so that we could have some data behind um, the story. And the reason that's important is because uh, this type of um, assessment information helps us um, put uh, figures to what's going on so that we can pursue grant funding, so that we can um, get professional recommendations, so we can incorporate uh, recommendations into our designs. And so tonight is the step of reviewing um, all that information, some of the recommendations from the um, consultant, and then talking about the next steps moving forward from Rango Avenue. It's working. Yeah, I don't think it's on. I might have to just ask you this. Thank you. Um, let's jump back one slide. So the scope of work for the consultant was to um, collect a great deal of field data 
um, traffic counts all through the corridor. Um, take a look at the last 10 years of collision analysis, uh, track speeding through the corridor, um, evaluate uh, vehicles compliance at stop signs using video monitoring, um, doing overall field review of Marengo Avenue, and then in particular, taking a look at um, the Marengo Alhambra uh, intersection that we share with the city of Alhambra. And that was a particular interest um, that we learned after talking to the community. So here's Marengo Avenue, uh, for those of you who are familiar. Um, it's uh, in the city of South Pasadena, it starts at Alhambra Road and goes up to Mission Street, and then it terminates for the remainder of South Pasadena. Um, south of Alhambra Road, I think it's Palm Avenue. And as you can see, there are many stop controlled intersections uh, along Marengo Avenue, which you'll see in some of the data here. And then we, of course, have the um, traffic uh, light control at Huntington Drive. So as far as the um, overall traffic volume on Marengo Avenue, the city designates Marengo as a collector street in the general plan. And at its peak uh, on any given day, it's about 3,000 uh, vehicles per day. Um, so you see it moving in the, uh, you can see the numbers there for the north and southbound. Um, and uh, you can see the peaks are obviously at uh, Huntington Drive where it intersects with Huntington Drive Major Arterial Street. Next slide, Danielle, thank you. So these next few slides are just really looking at uh, breaking down that average daily volume. Everything that you're seeing here are just um, graphics that are pulled out of the report that you have in your hands and the report that was posted online as part of the um, agenda item. And so for most of the intersections, uh, we see what we would expect, that um, there's a peak in the morning and the evening, and it's revealed that the peaks uh, are inverse of each other. So in the morning, we have most of the vehicles going northbound, in the evening, we have most of the vehicles going southbound. Um, and then during the midday, um, it's pretty consistent the way the traffic moves. Um, and this is the case for almost all the intersections except for one. So here you can see the section of Marengo between the southern section between Alhambra and Maple Street. We jump to the next slide. Very similar um, for uh, Huntington to Maple Street. Um, the only difference here is you'll see the volume is much higher. So you see 180 vehicles uh, in the peak uh, morning and evening. Next slide. Um, here, going uh, north of Huntington Drive, you see about half that. So most of the volume, as you would expect, is between Alhambra and Huntington on Marengo Avenue. So you still see these uh, diurnal peak, this um, northbound and southbound even, uh, morning and evening. Uh, and that's to Laurel Street there. Hey, Ted, yep. so, I, so I understand this. Yes. This is saying that in the morning, more people are heading north on Marengo, like towards Pasadena. Um, yeah, I mean, towards Mission Street. Uh, towards so Mission probably, Street. you know, whether the, we don't have the data on whether they're going to Fair Oaks or whether they're going, you know, towards San Marino. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, that's yeah. exactly right. I mean, I would imagine they're not going so much towards San Marino, right? Because there's... No, I not many job centers that way, right? Likely not. Our expect our thought here is that people are using Marengo to basically avoid um, Fair Oaks or um, or, Fremont. or they're collecting on the Marengo from the southeast neighborhood of South Pasadena. Do I guess would be interesting to know is are we getting traffic that's go, like are they going up, going to hit like a la Mission, go down Mission, hitting the one ten, or are they going up? you know, crossing over and then going up into Pasadena. It would be really hard it, to... You know, and we end at, you know, we end at Mission there, basically. So it's like, you know, where are they moving from there? Because they've obviously gone that, gone that distance. Sure. You know, we wouldn't be able to model that without a really sophisticated uh, approach. You know, um, that would probably take something along the lines of, like, license tracking to, like, see which vehicles... This is all done with pneumatic tubes, which is classic traffic counts for a linear corridor. Um, so we don't really know that. You know, we could try to see if there's a regional model out there that has that type of information, but it would be hard to take this local um, snapshot to see how it applies to the 
regional uh, freeway network. Because right now, you, the furthest you take it, you're taking it up all the way to Mission, right? Exactly, yeah. From we Alhambra. don't have it like stopping. We don't have the differentiation between Huntington and Mission. Like I'm wondering how much we lose, trying to figure out how many we lose on that segment. Like, are we losing people that have gone all the way up to Huntington and Alhambra Road? Well, and I mean, they're going east or west. You could, then, we could certainly show you the counts at those intersections. Like we can tell you okay. what's happening um, at Marengo and Huntington. Like who's taking, who's turning left, who's turning right, who's going from Huntington right. on to Marengo and vice versa. Right. Same thing with Mission Street. We can give you all the information. We just can't really tell you beyond that what's happening. Yes. Sorry, I don't want to throw a wrench in it. Um, I guess I'm going to the intersection turning movement count page. I think I'm looking at the AM peak and this is... Rango Avenue at Alhambra Road. Sure. In the morning. Uh, can I shoot to which page you're on? Yeah, no problem. It's the, the first page appendix of Appendix C. C. All right, and so this is, I believe, Marengo Avenue at Alhambra Road, which is the shared border with South Pasadena and Alhambra. If I look at that morning column, so I know this is more than an hour, but it's 7 to 9.45, I see northbound 261 vehicles, southbound 347 vehicles. So maybe I'm pulling out, maybe I'm pulling out one day in the whole analysis and this i'm not understanding this correctly but yeah because the, kind of the charts are an average of the counts over the days that it was collected okay yeah. so so on this day the southbound was like 80 86 vehicles higher than the northbound uh on so you're looking at the marengo alhambra the first page there and you're looking at the number of Southbound total vehicles um, in that that time is three hundred and forty seven, and then the northbound is two hundred and sixty one. Straight, yeah, moving straight. Right, right. Oh, okay, yeah. I guess I'm not. Yeah, I guess you have to add the turning movement counts in. Sure. Right. You know, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I see where you're going. I could take a look at this uh, closer to see, um, you know, I think you're looking for a, a more, a correlation to the graph. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, may, maybe not. I, I think, I think when I saw the graph and I was trying to compare that with my own lived experience. <laughs> sure. But, um, but it's, yeah. And, and, you know, that's a good comment for this entire, uh, report. I mean, especially when we talked about stop compliance mm -hmm. and speeding, um, where the averages are not going to, are not going to reveal the, you know, experiences that folks have, you know, you experience somebody going 50 plus miles per hour on Marengo. It's not going to really be evident in the chart necessarily. Right. The percentage of that happening is low, but when it does happen, it's impactful. So we, we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I, I was, think, cause I guess in my mind and what, what people do, I feel like is they had down Huntington westbound towards downtown LA and they make a left turn in the morning and they're heading towards the like the job centers in downtown LA and wherever and then in the afternoon it's kind of the reverse. But oh, I, maybe maybe people on Ringo know better and anyway, maybe the data is the data, but I it's opposite of what I thought it was. So it's good that we have these counts. Yeah, um and uh you are seeing on this particular chart you're seeing a higher number going southbound than northbound on this um Al you know, marengo avenue alhambra road to maple There's and are you, are you talking about this chart that's up here right now yeah are you talking about the counts no i'm talking about the chart the the graph you have up now in essence the southbound has a higher number 
in the afternoon. Yes. Yeah, morning. Slightly so higher. Slightly yeah. Higher, more You're looking like 162 out. average versus like 157 average, right. something like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But to yeah. your point, you're, there's a, even here, you're seeing more southbound than you would think. Yeah. I think um, intuitively we'd think, oh, it's all, it's all mostly northbound, more northbound. Yeah, because your, your experiences with, say, Fair Oaks is like the way people are traveling. Um, and so, uh, yeah, um, that could be. I'm not sure what the conclusion to make of that. I see what right. you're saying. No, it's good. Yeah, um, yeah. good day to have. Yeah, we could talk to the consultant a little bit more about that. Like, why is it the inverse of what's expected on Fair Oaks? Uh, they didn't take a look at it regionally to see where people are going. Mm -hmm. Really, the concern was like, what's happening on the street? What can we do about okay. it? Okay. Okay. But I, I hear what you're saying, and I think your interest sort of expands beyond uh, this scope. But I, I, we can probably follow up with some more information on that. Cool. Okay. Okay, so um, again, uh, similar patterns along all the segments of the roadway. Uh, Danielle, if you can jump to the next slide. And really where you see a diversion from that, if you can go back one, um, and the consultant made note of this, is that small section um, south of Laurel Street that they just identified that there's multiple peaks in the afternoon. Can you go back to that one for a second? So I'm wondering, let's see. I'm wondering to correlate again, because the days, the two fall days were obviously school in session. So I'm wondering if the peaks also match up somewhat with this, with not only do you have your work, but your school. Exactly, um, yes. Uh, you know, ceasing and people being pick up and all that kind of thing that you've got, plus for the middle school and the elementary. Yeah, and the consultant drew that same conclusion too in some of the other areas of the report that you do see a different pattern because of that school impact, um, particularly with speeding and stop, you know, people are um, considerate of the school area in that way where they might not necessarily be in other areas. Okay. Um, so again, we can we can dig into this a little bit deeper if you'd like to go through the volume analysis. Um, the next part of the scope for the consultant was the collision analysis. If you can jump one more, Daniel, I think it is. Or the next one after that. Okay, perfect. So um, we asked them to pull every record they could find on collision analysis, which included um, the state system, the Switter system, as well as um, our own police department. And so uh, this is the av this is the um, total collision numbers that they came up with over the ten year period, and you can see how things fluctuate over time, um, increase in more recent years, um, and then you can see the DUI specific collisions that are called out on the graph, um, particularly in twenty two and twenty three. They took this data uh, a step further to take a look at the pedestrian and bike involved collisions. Um, and again, Marengo, because of its bike lanes, is a popular um, cycling route. And you can see here that uh, over time, um, it's hard to really find a trend with that data, but you can see that uh, in 21, 22, there was recent uh, collisions. Do you know which ones of these are ped and which ones of these are bike? Um, we have that data in yeah. here. We try okay. to summarize it here. Sure. I mean, the ones that... Um, call out a ped when they're only one that mm. those are all peds so like 13 right i can tell yeah exactly and then the 22 pedestrian collision okay maybe i'm not understanding this but i don't see any call out of a bike collision um so i think that uh 2019 might have been a bike collision it's in this data here it says 2019 says vehicle. Yeah. That's a vehicle. That one's vehicle violation. Uh, the other ones are pedestrian. Is that, where they, is that where they maybe hit the pedestrian or bi hit the bicycle? Yeah, I think so. I think that's probably a vehicular so, violation that was. So we don't know whether it's pet or bike. Uh, no, 
I think that was a bike, but I can we can pull up the information. We've got the tables in the report that's in the packet here. So if you jump to in your packet, if you jump to the report page eleven. Oh, it doesn't have the uh, it doesn't have the 2019 year. It breaks it down for 21, 22, and 23. It's interesting oh, you. though, if you look at you know, okay. the last time we were at this high number we had in last year in 2023 was in 2016 with 14 collisions. Yeah, that's right. I, I see the bike collision on page 14, um, August 23rd, 2019, 12 feet west of Marengo Avenue, one bicycle, right? Yes. Eastbound right, northbound through. Uh, on, on which date? Um, October 23rd, 2019. And that's on page 14 of the report. Yeah. So um, we asked our consultant to do a little bit of a broader, um, uh, a little bit of a broader mapping of these, uh, the types of collisions and where they occurred. Uh, Danielle, can you jump to the next slide? You can see um, on the left here, uh, the majority of them are kind of other. And a lot of that was because some of the police reports don't necessarily detail um the uh the collision type necessarily like they do in the Switters reports um so there's a there's a chunk there that we don't have much information on but you could see uh, beyond that the majority of collisions are broadside collisions i know that the chp 555 form um lumps together right angle crashes or t-bone crashes they count that as broadside but they also count left turn crashes also as broadside you know what i'm saying yeah um do we have do you know the breakdown in that broadside category right left turn crashes versus right angle crashes we have the breakdown in the tables i don't have that charted to know how many are of one and of mm -hmm. which but we could absolutely evaluate that similarly it takes those same um 89 collisions and uh divides them up by the intersection. And as you would expect, you've got a higher concentration at Huntington and then slightly less at Alhambra. Okay, and then um, lastly on the collision um, analysis, next slide, Danielle, thank you, uh, are the primary collision factor as determined in the splitter system. And again, the unknown ones are because the data that was coming in didn't have a primary collision factor noted, um, but the others do. And you have there at the top of the list, unsafe speed uh, and traffic signals and signs related collisions. Ted, is there a way to know um, whether or not the, the collisions that are happening at Huntington are, are also running red lights? Would that be indicated on any of the police reports or how would they indicate that? Because I'm seeing a lot more of that activity. Sure. Um, People running red lights. Traffic signs and traffic signals and signs. Yeah, that would be incorporated into that. If there was comments on the report um, or if there was a police report associated, you could find out um, how it broke down. Uh, I think that that's an expectation that that was part of that number, because um, certainly one of the recommendations, and I'll get to this, is about making adjustments to that traffic light system so that we can hold red times longer. Because I think there's, I think that would, you know, a lot of the broadsides 
when people run the red lights. Sure. Yeah. And you do have, you know, Huntington Marengo, as you all know, is that oblong intersection. It's much longer than it is. Well, which, you know, the north south section of it is much longer. Um, so those um, turning movements um, where people are basically pulling up alongside each other as they're turning through the intersection uh, cause an issue. I think the also the question is, as you say, the timing, because I think a lot of people end up wanting to run that red light because it's a long signal going right. northbound and southbound to lay, you know, to lay the land, you know, for the timing for Huntington to go either uh, east or west. Right. So you're waiting. Say, oh, for, no, I got to make this. I got to get through here. Yeah. Otherwise, you got to wait for the whole Huntington cycle. I don't want to wait for the next my next signal cycle. Yeah, which is why we think that's a valuable comment that, you know, if we were to install a raid uh, detection system there, and it, this is, you know, farther on the presentation, but uh, that would probably um, allow some improvements because you could hold a red time a little bit longer as someone's trying to make that long distance to the intersection. Um, so we found that that unsafe speeds number uh, was interesting. So we asked the consultant to break that down a little further on the next slide. Um, and so you can see, this is the unsafe speeds broken down per year. Um, no real you know, discernible trend there. Um, but again, you can see as far as where, the inter where those um, collisions uh, based on unsafe speeds are happening are primarily at Huntington and O'Hamlin. Sorry to interrupt you again. Um, sure. Do you, and maybe it's on here. Um, I guess the breakdown of crashes by loc by intersection type, like or, or by intersection or mid block. Like are these like I see that you say Alhambra Road, Huntington Drive, Mission Street. Not all these are at the intersection, right? Are some of these mid block? That's a good point. So um, they're within. They were. Um, within a certain distance of the intersection when they were reported. Mm -hmm. um, the consultant uh, took like things that were um, actually mid-block, like not at an intersection, mm -hmm. and put it in their own category as other mid-block. But for the most of the consideration, it's, inter it's um, collisions that were within a certain distance of the intersection. Okay. Yeah. It and for um, collisions that happen on, say, another street, like Huntington, uh -huh. Or Maple or um, Alhambra, Road. they got grouped into that intersection. So it might be that, like, in a, in a, in a collision happened on Alhambra Road approaching Marengo, mm. but we showed it as the Alhambra intersection. Mm. It, and that's in the table, like, it, it doesn't it? It okay. says this is like 48 feet north of Huntington. Uh, 50, 150 feet east of Marengo. Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm I'm talking out loud, but you know, if considering the fatal crash at Marengo and Maple, you know, if if we're seeing a majority of our crashes at intersections, then we should focus our attention to intersections, right? And those types of countermeasures over. Yeah, understood. Versus yeah. like you know, uh, but you know it. At the mid block between two intersections far apart. Yeah. So, Ted, where we show uh, collisions due to unsafe speeds, that would be an unsafe speed on Marengo Avenue, correct? Um, not necessarily. If we needed to break it out a little bit we more like that, we could. Um, it, it would include something that if someone were, say, traveling at unsafe speed on Huntington, um, and the collision happened at Marengo, it would include those also. Okay. Yeah. So, and the idea behind that is that, like, you know, recommendations from improvements wouldn't just be for the Marengo movement. They'd be for the entire intersection movement. So we were trying to look at where to focus, where, where we should be focusing. So somebody, but we could break it down that far if we needed to. Yeah. So if somebody was going um, eastbound on Huntington, going to make a right-hand turn onto... Marengo southbound, then the person on Huntington speeding and runs into that car. We're counting that as a Marengo accident. We're counting it as a an accident that happened Marengo on the Marengo corridor. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
and you know we could break it out just for um, evaluation sake, but ultimately when we're designing the improved intersection, we're looking at all the movements of the intersection. So we want to know what, you know, we group that all together. Okay. Um, all right. So we can come back to that, but that was the consultant summary on the collision analysis. Let's look at the speeding analysis next. So um, here's a summary of the speedy analysis. The consultant didn't see a, um, a uh, overarching speeding issue from the numbers alone on Marengo. Certainly there's instances of speeding and I wanna talk about that. Um, but what they, this is a summary of the, what was yielded from the speed um, collection data. So, you know, Marengo is a 25 mile per hour street, except for in the school zones, it's uh, 15 miles per hour. And what they found was that the average speed um, ranged in the, you know, high 20s. You can see the green arrows there are the average speeds for a particular segment. And then looking at the 85th percentile, which is, as we know, you know, that's um, the majority of vehicles. And that's what we base um, speed limits on when we're taking a look at uh the uh, you know natural movement of vehicles in a, on a street um, was uh, a bit higher than that. Uh, well, not the majority of vehicles, yeah. the 85th percentile. The 85th percentile. So, so, 80, so 85 out of 100 vehicles are traveling 31 miles per hour. Exactly. Below. Yes. Thanks. But 15 of 100 are traveling above 31, right? Above 31, and then, you know, as you'll see from the tables, even in excess of that, you know, some vehicles be traveling at 50 or above. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, they found average speeds for the whole corridor between 23 and 29, 85th percentile speeds between 26 and 31. Um, of course, slower speeds during the peak traffic hours, as you would expect. Um, and then, really, the speeds were higher south of Huntington longer straightaways. Um, you've got the Huntington to Alhambra connection, and then you have more stop signs, not that that controls speeds, but you have broken up segments uh, north of Huntington. So uh, like, oh, I'm sorry, Daniel, if you jump to the next slide, this is the one I was just talking about here. So uh, next slide, um, the, in the report, you'll see all of the data charted. So I wanna call out how this works. Um, you see the color coding on the left, the light green and the, you know, the dark green uh, show um, speeds around the speed limit and then everything else is above that. So um, the taller the number on the chart is the number of vehicles that were going that speed. It's not the speed of the vehicle. So if you see on this chart, which is between Maple and Alhambra, Around 7.30 a.m., you've got 60 vehicles going between 26 and 29. You've got 60 vehicles going between 35 and 39. And then you've got other vehicles going faster than that. So on this particular chart at that time, yeah, you didn't really see anyone going 50 and above, but you did see vehicles going between 40 and 44. But if you look at throughout the day, you do see um, small red dots, which show there was one or two vehicles that were traveling well above the speed limit at that time. We can't see that, Ted. Well, <laughs> you got to. <laughs> it's there. We'll somewhere. do a yeah, zoom in there. But you can see if you look at your report, you can see it on probably on the printed version in front of you. So what that number was specifically was, you know, in this particular segment, you've got an average speed of 29 miles per hour. You've got your 85th percentile at 31, and then you've got 9% of vehicles um, going southbound that were over 35 miles per hour, and 6% of vehicles uh, over 35 uh, going northbound. So not necessarily a chronic speeding problem, as you might see on the streets, but certainly there's some acute speeding issues. Okay, and we have the similar chart for other segments that you can go through. We'll hop through them quickly here. So you can see, um, you know, more people obeying the speed limit um, in the latter part of the day between uh, 
Maple and Alhambra southbound because we saw generally there was more vehicles moving southbound at later in the day. Let's jump to the next slide. There's a few of these, of course. Um, similarly, uh, Huntington to Maple northbound. And you see, you can if you can see well enough, you can see there are some um, reds and yellows at the bottom of those peak hours. And then this is southbound. And let's jump north of uh, Huntington, which is um, the segment south of Laurel Street. And jump to the next one, southbound on Laurel, south of Laurel Street. Thanks, Danielle. Um, north of Linden Street. So we see the number of people, um, you know, just generally coming down in these sections of the street. Let's jump to the next slide for southbound. And then Marengo to Oxley. Northbound, Marengo to Oxley, southbound. And I think the last one's the last segment. Oh, no, that's, that covers it. That's where the speed um, detectors were uh, set up there. OK, questions on the speeding analysis? We can jump to the stop compliance analysis. So, so Ted, you're saying that most of it you're seeing on the more the south, well, I was going to say, yeah, the southern south of Huntington and those corridors. And yeah, you're, you've got a higher volume of traffic south of Huntington. Um, and you're seeing more, um, more folks are speeding above 35 miles per hour in those areas. So if you look to the right, we tried to summarize. If you can jump back up, um, Danielle, sorry, we're jumping around. I'll go up one more slide. So for example, here on the right here, only 3% of of vehicles are moving at 35 miles per hour above. But if you jump back a couple of slides, Danielle, to one of those other, this is one to 2%. And then let's jump south of 1%, less than 1%. Let's jump south of Huntington, go a little farther back. One more, you know, 7%. And then the, inner, the section behind, before that was 9%. You know, the section before that was 9%, 6%. And would you say, I mean, a lot that, that makes sense logically too, not just because of the volume, but the the spans of no stop signs and that the street is substantially wider past south of Huntington. Yeah, there's a couple of reasons. There's that, um, there's Alhambra and Huntington themselves. Um, there's the shorter segments. There is the school, the consultant found that people are relatively observant of speeding and, and obeying stop signs in the school area. Um, and then, you know, you don't have the city of Alhambra. You know, people are, when they're driving, they're driving through the Alhambra intersection at Mission Street, they're going left or going right. Um, okay, let's jump down a couple slides to the stop compliance analysis. So um, as you saw earlier in the presentation, there's quite a number of all-way stop-controlled um, intersections along Marengo Avenue. So we did um, stop compliance surveys at the majority of them. And this just basically summarizes everything. And this is interesting because you can see that um, the percentage of vehicles that completely stopped um, ranges and uh, on the high end, it's like 63%. So that means you know, two thirds of people are coming to complete stop, um, and then the percentage of rolling stops is actually the basically the remainder of that. Um, so you know, we see rolling stops as people know that they should stop, but they're not stopping. Versus um, the green area, which is kind of ironic, but that's the the folks that did not stop at all. Um, and so there's a couple per intersection that's happening. Um, and you know, we don't know if that's because they don't know to stop or they're just ignoring the stop sign, but there are those instances. Did you weed out cyclists in this or did you lump them in? This is vehicles. Yeah, this, Vehicle, okay. this is not vehicles. Cyclists. Yeah. All right. Of course. Yeah. You know, no, no, we would expect cyclists to sometimes you know, want to roll roll through because it's yeah, very exactly. difficult to yeah. stop on a bike. Um, it seems like there's also a correlation between 
the cross streets that have major traffic, whether or not you stop. Exactly. So yeah. Alhambra Road, you have major cross traffic. Oak Street, you have cross traffic. Not really Bank, but Monterey Road. So if you're on Marengo, people are more likely to stop on those intersections because there's likely going to be another vehicle. On, right. On one of the right. Other exactly. Approaches. Yeah, that would prohibit them from rolling through. Ted, do we have the correlation of knowing the people that just ran through did not stop at what time of day those were? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's our next couple of slides. Okay. Let's jump to that. I'm glad you brought it up. So um, this is looking at uh, Alhambra Road. And um, from our previous slide, you could see that, you know, people coming to a complete stop at Alhambra were between 15, 60 percent rolling stops, 40 to 45. And then there's a small percentage of not stopping, but those do happen. And the majority of the um, rolling stops on the northbound approach were either around you know, 9 a.m. or 2 p.m. Um, the people who were coming to a complete stop, probably because of the volume of traffic um, around 5 p.m. were high. Um, and then similar, uh, similar trend on the southbound. Looking at this, would you say there is a trend that correlates with school drop-offs and pickups time as far as the stop signs? I mean, I know people are more conscious of speed overall around the schools, but it seems like in the drop-off in pickup times of the elementary school, there's more rolling, rolling in. So the, the consultant, it may be perhaps in the other intersections, the consultant did find that close to the schools that people were obeying it, probably because there is, you know, crossing guard and there's activity across the crosswalk. So, you know, you, you're not rolling through or you're not, not stopping at that, but yeah, you might be able to make that inference on the other intersections that are farther away leading from the school. the school. Yeah. Leading up to the school. Yeah. yeah. But all throughout the day, there are a couple of people not stopping. Sorry if I'm not speaking yeah. in the mic all throughout the day. There are a couple of people not stopping every single hour. Yes. You see that in the green there. Um, so we have the similar data for um, jumping to the next slides here. Uh, so uh, Maple Street um, probably, you know, shows this yellow more than any other intersection uh, of the rolling stops are at 60, 65 percent. And that's through the day, um, especially in the morning and in the afternoon. Wow. Um, huh. Here's a huh. Spruce Street. Wow. I don't want to. A lot of rolling stops in Spruce. Yeah. You don't have any cross traffic there, right? And doesn't Spruce, does it T? No, it doesn't. No, it goes over one block and ends at Milan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, straight to Fair Oaks and then to Milan there. Yeah. And uh, let's jump to, uh, we have Laurel here. Um, interesting enough on Laurel. Sorry, Danielle. Um, you have the you have the majority a different pattern between um, southbound and northbound. Uh, complete stops in the morning, followed by about approximately even rolling and complete stops in the afternoon, and then in the southbound, primarily uh, rolling, you know, rolling stops. Okay, let's jump to uh, Oak Street here. Go back to Oak. So, sure. This the crossing guards. They yeah. make you stop, right? Yeah. Right. You I mean, the seven a.m., eight a.m. We have that. Um, you know, we have our slow streets traffic calming. Um, so implementation that was last there. August. So this that would have been in effect when you did these counts. That's right. So these were done in like after that installation. And then I think our next slide here, next two is um, bank, where you can see um, that pattern of uh, complete stops northbound more so, but then rolling stops more so on the southbound. And then lastly, uh, Monterey Road. Where you have, um, more complete stops, you know, 
more relatively. You're talking at like 63 to 56% versus 37 to 40%. Because you have a three-way stop there. I'm sorry, I'm thinking mission. Yeah, um, we didn't do, um, that's a good point too. We didn't do the stop compliance um, at the three-way, at the, um, we did it at the all-way stops. So including the three-way stops, we didn't do stop compliance at like Linden or Rollins Street, which is just the three um, approach intersections with one stop. And so we're clear, this is just Marengo. The stop this compliance is, is just only on Marengo. Yes, this not, is, not, yeah, not this a, is just north and okay. southbound Marengo. Yep. Uh, done by video analysis. And so that's why the percentages are a little loose too, because you have somebody interpreting a rolling stop. It's not like a computer. Well, it's not like a instrument that's doing it. It seems interesting though, that on the, looking at this um, at, Marine, uh, at Monterey, that we've got a lot on the southbound, there seems to be a lot more no stopping at all. That's the most green I think of the charts you've shown, I believe. Right. Um, and so, uh, pull this up here. So it's, it's, they don't have a percentage there, but that looks like it's a higher percentage. Is that the 7% overall? So yeah, I mean, if you if you're at that Monterey intersection, if you're familiar with it, you know it's not like the um, it's not offset, so you could just roll right through that intersection. Um, and then we didn't they didn't give us an average of the um, non stopping in those couple intersections. Okay. Uh, but you can see from the chart, there's a good amount of green there, so yeah. representing at least a few every hour. Which is interesting because then I don't think I have to go back to your earlier, like how did that correlate to that particular as far as collisions? Sure. Because um, if you, you know, the, the the odds would be if you got all higher number of people that are not stopping at all, that you would end up having more collisions. But I don't think that silly held well those numbers. It's a good point. I so this think this is also a two day or yeah, two days. Yeah, so that's the differential is that in this case, it's it's basically a present look at it versus a um, past look. And then also, um, there's no data on whether there was someone else in the intersection when the person was rolling stop. So they could have just been rolling stop. No one else was coming. They you know, felt that there was no danger, no risk of collision, and they rolled through the stop sign. Not that they should have done that, of course. Um, okay, so the next section of the consultant's work was doing um, just a you know field review based on their experience. So they did note um, the contributions to um, safe driving and cap and traffic calming that the um, bike lanes presented, um, the traffic calming measures that the city's implemented, particularly there on Oak Street, um, and then we've got the crossing sign. Um, paddles that we regularly um, attempt to replace uh, throughout the city. Um, they did note the in-roadway warning lights and that they're uh, inappropriately located at two of the intersections because those are um, stop controlled. So um, it conflicts with that the state requirements to have a um, on-demand controlled device, and then also a stop controlled device. So we've actually covered those uh, roadway lights and taken them out of operation. A lot of people don't understand why we've done that, but that's precisely because um, people are supposed to be stopping that intersection um, by law. And to have a um, pedestrian light that signals that someone should stop for them, it conflicts with that um, stop sign. So that's why we've covered those up. Those will likely have to be removed at some future time. Not to say they can't be replaced with, you know, other improvements. Um, the consultant did note that there's a wide variety of crosswalk types across the corridor. There's ladder types, there's, you know, um, just two line crosswalks. 
they're not on all sides of the intersection. They, they seem not random, but they seem to be kind of placed on, you know, the east side or the west side or the north side or the south side. Um, so they think that that's uh, worthwhile to take a look at that placement. You know, some cities, if they have, say, a safe routes to school plan, will particularly designate where their crosswalks should be because they want students or pedestrians to use a certain side of the street. Um, not clear if that was the plan or case on Marengo. It's just sort of configured the way it is. Um, did have some comments on Marengo elementary loading and unloading for the most part done fairly well. Uh, consultant just felt like it made sense to um, provide some education to the users of the loading zones. So they know not to double park. You know, whoever's setting up the cones knows to not have their back to traffic, that type of thing. So worth some communication with um, the school. And then also brought up uh, some of the red curb daylighting. We've done a little bit of, of this in the city, um, but this is essentially keeping that, you know, 20 feet of um, curb uh, open, it, aka red curb at intersections so that um, vehicles, drivers can see uh, pedestrians a lot easier. Okay, and then on to um, Marengo and Hambra. So we asked the consultant based on the community feedback to take a, a special look at the inter intersection. You could see the volumes and the turn counts there. Um, you can also see that there's only um, crosswalks on the south and um, east sides, yet on the right picture, which is the peak hour pedestrian counts, you can see that folks are using the other um, crosswalk areas. Now that's illegal, of course, but uh, they don't have the protections that they would if there was crosswalks implemented there. Now, um, a little bit about this intersection, it is uh, fully owned by Alhambra, the city boundary starts at the south property line of those South Pasadena homes to the north. Um, so we've engaged with the city of Alhambra a bit. Um, Marengo Matters is engaged with the city of Alhambra. Um, we're hoping to continue that and um, come to a solution together about this intersection, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Did you say the south property line? So, so uh, that house on the corner of the north um, west corner of Marengo, that's in South Pasadena. Its south property line is the city border. So the sidewalk, the north sidewalk is in Alhambra. Um, so any improvements to this intersection would of course require any um, non-maintenance improvements would of course require upgrading those uh, crosswalks or those ADA um, ramps. That's difficult here because of the storm drain configuration. So it isn't a simple upgrade. It, it's it would be costly, and there'd be have to be some infrastructure work done. And are you engaging them because we want to mark um, the unmarked crosswalks? Well, we engage them for a number of reasons. Number one, um, they just had a change in management there. Their longtime public works director just retired a couple months ago, so we're trying to reestablish our relationship for other things too, not just transportation. Um, on the transportation front, you know they've got a seven ten stub. We're concerned about that. You know, that's something we need to discuss. Uh, we have other streets that we have, you know, been called to our attention, like Fletcher and, um, yeah, exactly. So, um, so there's, that's one reason, but this was a particular opportunity. The timing is right to have a conversation with them. Um, so I think we can float a couple ideas there, both um, short-term and long-term. And of course, you know, try to share the, burden in terms of uh, the work and possibly seeking funding. Yeah. Quick question. To, I know this is kind of, I didn't see it in there, but um, roundabouts, was there, did the consultant consider at all at any places for roundabouts like this intersection potentially? I mean, I just saw a thing about all these cities and stuff adding, starting to really go with roundabouts and adding those for traffic calming and um moving you know with e more ease potentially and all that and what it's doing and you know taking a step from europe and i know that the mayor came back and talked about france and roundabouts yeah I mean, and, and even closer to home so marengo matters submitted uh, some public comments and include some really interesting materials on pasadena's new roundabouts and that's in the um materials tonight 
Um, I think it's, we think it's a really interesting idea here at the intersection. The consultant didn't evaluate that yet. We didn't ask them to, but that might be something that we want to entertain. Uh, that's one of the ideas that we want to discuss with Alhambra to see what their thoughts are on that. You know, one comment here is that, you know, we have these particular counts, you can see the volumes, but there's a part, there's a, you know, large park with a lot of community interest right here, Alhambra Park. Um, and, uh, you know, the volumes to this intersection are even higher on, on an event day in that park. We don't have that data, but we know that to be true. So there's a, there's a lot going on at this intersection. If you visit it, you'll know that it's just always busy. There's always something happening, you know, good and bad. And, um, yeah, we think that there's some, you know, a lot of potential for this. And there does, there is quite a bit of room here. So, you know, one thought is to have a conceptual drawn up of a roundabout. And, you know, we want to do that with Alhambra's buy-in. We don't want to be designing things in other cities that they have no interest in pursuing. But, um, yeah, that's, that's an interest, really interesting idea. It's also the gateway into the city or one, you know. Yes. And so that, that point was made um, in some of our other efforts that it is a gateway into the city. You know, maybe one day it can feature some sort of signage or something like that. A roundabout would be a good, really good way to do that. Um, so that's an idea. Um, okay, so let's jump to overall recommendations. So the consultant had a lot of um, general ideas and uh, discussion on whether those would apply here. So certainly some simple things like speed feedback signs, and we're implementing those on Fremont and Huntington right now. Um, so we've established um, the vendor we're using is actually happens to be one that Marengo Matters looked at as, as well, and that's in the packet. Um, so we're, we got, our staff got training on how to operate those signs, what their capabilities are. Um, they do have some limitations. Uh, you know, if you want to utilize solar signs, of course you need to open, you know, you can't have a tree canopy. That's problematic on Marengo. We've solved that in other locations in the city by tying them into electrical service at a nearby street light. So it's really just about placement and making sure that we get that um, part right. So we want to take a look at that. Um, other things the consultant offered are sort of other solutions they've used in other, in other cities, like raised crosswalks, um, rumble strips, ball bouts, which we're all familiar with. Um, we did ask the consultant to take a look at our speed hump policy. So uh, there's a lot of points in that policy. Um, under the current form of the policy, not to say that that can change, Marengo wouldn't technically be eligible for speed humps because it's a collector street, but that's really like a policy decision. Um, the other technical reasons not to do speed humps don't necessarily apply on Marengo. Um, for example, we prohibit speed humps on streets that have like a high grade because it's just not safe for cars to, you know, launch or go over a speed hump on a high grade. That's not the case on Marengo. Um, so, you know, uh, the traffic volumes by our current speed hump policy, I think that they have to be within 500 to 2,500 vehicles per day. So um, does qualif so somewhat qualify there. Um, the concern that's really, you know, I, I don't know the history of speed humps in the city. Looking around, I don't really see any. So I'm sure it's an interesting history. But from what I understand, um, you know, part of the issue has been the impact to emergency vehicles. So we've talked to other cities and they've found ways around this by using different types of installations like speed cushions and things like that. Um, we're looking forward to um, our, uh, you know, we're getting a new fire chief in the city here soon. So, you know, we're looking forward to engaging the new department heads on this conversation to see what their thoughts are. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more to un unpack with regard to speed humps. Um, certainly, Rango qualifies under the 85th percentile, about on borderline. I think the 80 the, our current policy says that 85th percentile should be 31 miles per hour or higher, and that's uh, Marengo, according to the data that we have here. But, but I think it should be pointed out that it's not just what a fire chief thinks. Yeah. It, it's the people on the street, whether they think it is a benefit to them 
or whether they feel it uh, degrades their property values by having the markings and the bump and you know that type of thing. So we found a lot of times the people on a block did not want it. So that would be part of the threshold would be the current policy says 65% of the folks in a street segment would have to agree. Um, other cities use different numbers. They're like more like at least 67% because 65 is kind of an odd number. Um, uh, I think it's either um, Pasadena or Anaheim. I don't remember which city, but there is a city that actually has a um, fee associated with removing them. So, you know, they've had the experience of folks want a speed hump, it gets put in and then they don't want it anymore because of the impacts of the speed hump. And so the residents essentially have to bear the cost of the removal at that point. It's an interesting policy. There's come some really interesting ones out there, um, but most cities align on some major um, commonalities between speed hump policy, which is, you know, percentage of neighborhood that has to be a buy-in, you know, certain elevations can't have them, has to have a certain volume of traffic, has to have a certain length, you know, streets can't, you know, under a thousand feet long or over, you know, or so don't have speed humps. So there's some commonalities, but some have interesting um, factors and influence. What are, what are the next steps on that policy review? We haven't taken any action on it. I think that, um, you know, I think we're going to be confronted with this as we start to un undertake our neighborhood um, street repair program, because that's really the appropriate time to undertake it. So we really just want to take this first step by getting some comments on where do we sit with other cities and we're pretty much in the same place. Um, uh, Anaheim has a very elaborate and complicated speed hump implementation policy. They basically do a two-phase system where um, they'll implement mm -hmm. other uh, measures first, see if they work, and then consider speed humps. Um, but that's a lot to manage. So, so yeah, to answer your question, we're just really taking an initial look at it. Um, we get requests here and there. But your um, plan is to review that like with your neighborhood traffic management program? I think it's worth consideration um, in the neighborhood traffic management program, but also in the neighborhood, in the local street repair um, process. So I think it's worth a council discussion on how to apply the policy. Because okay. certainly you drive around Los Angeles County you do see speed humps on collectors and minor arterial streets. I, I you see them on major streets. Yeah, you exactly. See speed tables now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so it's worth reconsidering uh, how that gets applied. But, um, yeah, not an easy topic for sure. Yeah, we could <laughs> yeah. talk an entire meeting about that. Yeah. Um, I had one quick, quick yeah. question. I know you mentioned it in the presentation, but uh, you've got raised crosswalks here. But I'm assuming we, you mentioned earlier about also restriping re configuring, redesigning, repainting a lot of the crosswalks, and then also edge lines were appropriate, if that would help us with some of some of these areas again? Sure. Um, I don't you see know, that in here, but I know we've looked at that, and that's one thing we can... Yeah, I mean, I've got three pages of recommendations, so I, oh, I'm, I'm getting sorry. that. <laughs> I might jump but um, no, no, you're right. Uh, yeah, there's some things we can do in advance, and there's some things we can do later on. Um, you know, with a street with the built out bike lanes, um, a lot of that sign, a lot of that striping has been done, but there's other things that can be done. There's one interesting idea the consultant recommended, which I, we wanted your take on it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's signage upgrades, um, particularly the school signs, which some of them might be outdated, uh, stop signs, um, the consultant recommended up, upsizing some of them. Um, and then also considering uh, installing flashing stop signs. That one's tough because um, the person who lives next to that stop sign might not be too thrilled that it flashes all the time. So those are, um, you know, you have to really engage with people at the intersection about that. Um, another thing they brought up was, um, especially, well, I'll get to that in a moment here. Let me, let's jump ahead. Uh, ADE compliance we talked about, and then just our typical tree and lighting maintenance, making sure street lights are serviced and trees are trimmed back. Um, so particularly on Marengo and Huntington, some of the recommendations, and um, this would, the majority of these would be um, 
larger expense um, infrastructure upgrades. Now, fortunately, we do have that funding along Huntington. Are you showing that? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I thought I was. Thanks, Daniel. I've got my slides open over here. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do have that funding on Huntington that we could access for this type of stuff. It's, a, it's just that that funding only goes um, a certain amount, and we have the entirety of Huntington to consider. But some of the recommendations from uh, the consultant were um, upsizing the vehicle head indications there. You can see them in the photo. Um, and then as we're doing um, signal replacement on Huntington Drive, we consider implementing things that we've done, say, on Fair Oaks, uh, or we will be doing with Fair Oaks with our new equipment, uh, which is leading pedestrian intervals and then accessible pedestrian signal push buttons. And then what I mentioned earlier, which is these radar um, detection that can actually sense you know, a vehicle coming at a faster speed and hold the light longer um, or you know, I think it was the chair that mentioned um, those cars that would pass through the long intersection at Marengo. Um, now, one thing we're doing on Fair Oaks as part of our uh, Rogan project is trying to realign the left turn um, at the median noses. And that was an idea that the consultant had here too, especially at Huntington, was basically offsetting the vehicles more so you could see past them as you're making the left. The downside of that is that impacts the bike lanes. Right now, the bike lanes come almost all the way up to the intersection. Um, the bike lanes would have to be pulled back about 150 feet or so uh, in order to do this offsetting. And that's kind of a, you know, there's pros and cons to that because then you don't have a protected bike lane uh, in, the, in the area near the intersection. So to your point, Chair, um, you know, uh, there's some striping stuff that we can do here earlier, as long as it lines up with the signal heads correctly. Um, and then we can do signal improvements in the next several years as those other projects come online. And then lastly, the recommendations for Marengo and Hambra. So the consultant said, clearly consider additional crosswalks. Um, if that is done, then you know, we would, be required to take a look at the ADA compliance of those ramps. Um, and the, as I mentioned, the complication there is the storm drain catch basins. Um, in the meantime, we could make visibility modifications. And we, as in, I do mean we, as in us in Alhambra, um, visibility modifications. And then there's the um, full on infrastructure modifications, which could include bulb outs. The consultant didn't mention roundabouts, but we certainly think that's a possibility. Um, which was you know, part of the community feedback that we got from the neighborhood. And then again, these additional stop signs. So we could, uh, this intersection, because there's um, these uh, left turn lanes and uh, through lanes, we do have the um, ability to put additional stop signs on the street. So we could put one on not just the right, but on the left as well. And that might assist with stop compliance. Again, something to discuss with Alhambra, if there's room in the right of way to add another stop sign, set of stop signs. I'm sorry, you said stop sign or, or pavement marking? Um, they, they recommended that we could add stop signs. So we would literally be able to add a stop sign on the left uh, hand side of the street, which, you know, the oncoming traffic wouldn't see. But the, um, the uh, through traffic would see. That was a recommendation from the consultant. We didn't really consider that, but they added that in. Well, so this is a four-way stop. Right. So um, it's basically just additional signage. So you've got your stop sign. When you stop, you've got your stop sign on the right. They're oh. saying you could put, we could put a stop sign on the left. If you built an island. And <laughs> um, on, there. Or on an island, or they even said you could do it on the other curb. Really? Yeah, interesting, right? Okay. We didn't consider that. <laughs> um, okay, so let me jump to the next slide. So where does this fit in? Uh, I, this, I'm just bringing this slide up again. This is really just a reminder as to how this all fits into our overarching plan for street improvement. Um, you can see Marengo's what we designate as a blue street, meaning that it needs maintenance, and it needs maintenance probably in short order. You jump to the next slide, Danielle. So in our proposal to council, 
we actually scheduled this next summer for um, slurry sealing. And so um, let me jump to our next steps, our last slide there, Danielle. Um, just keeping that in the back of your mind, what we are planning on doing is in short order, coordinating with Alhambra on the shared intersection, talking about what could be done, um, developing our striping plan for the slurry um, seal project. Now in the majority of Marengo, that might mean things stay the same, like obviously the bike lanes continue, um, but it might mean some um, opportunities to make some other changes. For example, if we did wanna do that left turn offset, that's something that we could accomplish under that project. Um, we will be looking at locations for speed feedback signs, because we know that's something that we can implement fairly easy, not, you know, not overnight, and it does cost some money, but we think we can source that out of our local return money. Um, seeing if we can include Huntington signal upgrades at Marengo in the current Fremont Huntington project, if there's budget for that. And then um, seeking funding for the other infrastructure upgrades. If we do decide, say, to do some changes at Alhambra that require, you know, ADA ramps, realigning the lanes. Um, we've already applied for uh, the first phase of the Safe Streets for All planning money. Um, there's some other regional grant opportunities that are popping up uh, this year that we've got our eye on. Um, so really what we wanna do is engage with um, Alhambra, get an idea so that we can maybe apply for some funding with their support and co-supported uh, funding is always a lot easier to get than just us alone as one city. So um, that is everything we have on the safety assessment report. Um, obviously more uh, conversation to come, but happy to answer any questions you have. Just a quick question. Um, and the, cons the consulting company, the Charette, um, his name just went out of my head. Uh, so we use AGA engineers for this. Uh, the the Kashret company was Tool Design Group. Yeah. So you know the reason behind that was you know Tool is more we've utilized them and other cities has utilized them for on the more of the planning side. This was uh, really heavily weighted in the data analysis assessment side to give us a good solid report that we could use to justify improvements. I, I was just thinking, because I know they were looking at sort of the whole scope of the area. And as we look from like a Fremont to a Fair Oaks to a Morango, Huntington, et cetera, if there's a way that when we get everything moving, in some ways, there might be a natural manner to be able to, if you're, if you're coming up and you're, you're coming from southbound and you're going northbound on Morango, to get you to then potentially go go west on Huntington to, to feel that you have a better north traverse on Fair Oaks because we've improved the signals, we can work on that. I mean, versus the stop, the stop, the stop that they're going to experience northbound on Marengo. So to try to, again to get people to feel that that would be an, a more effective way to go northbound eventually, you know, that's their destination, than to continue on Marengo and going northbound. Sure. So um yeah, you know, tool design was focused on the Fair Oaks, Fremont Huntington corridors, but they were really taking a regional approach. Like we'll probably we got their um design memos back, our design memo back. We'll be presenting that to the commission hopefully in the next month or two. Um we, you know, they did have some comments on other streets because of the folks that visited the shred process. They didn't really focus on it. Didn't offer any design concepts, just you know, some discussion. Um, we certainly expect them to provide probably some commentary on the regional issue. So you know, the Pasadena stub issue that creates the issue on Fair Oaks and on that's going to be part of it. So you know, I, I think that's um, you know, it all fits together. Uh, we're not going to have any. Um, Things specifically related to that on Marengo just yet. It's really just going to be kind of like a overarching planning effort and the tool design work, if that helps clarify. 
I just keep thinking at some point if you've got like left hand turn arrow or yeah, left hand turn arrows that would get you to move to get you over so we can get we can funnel people instead of going up Fremont and going up Marengo, you're gonna take the northbound uh route of taking Fair Oaks because we can coordinate the signals. We've spent the money for the synchronization. We can work on some things to say this is the way you should go. Yeah, Take I mean it off the residential as much as you know, as much as we can. Sure. I mean, um tools design philosophy isn't is more along the lines of like eliminating the trips versus, you know, right. Enhancing the functionality of the intersection. So we probably won't get that kind of thing from them, but we do have this separate um work with KOA to do the synchronization and the upgrades, the signals on Faro. So we do think that's going to improve the operation and that could likely relieve, um, you know, some of the volume on Morango because it's easier to navigate on Faro's. Yeah. Um, I have a couple questions and I do want to hear, I think we have some public comment too at some point. Um, I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of great data in here and a lot of great data collection and they you know they collected a ton of data can we go back to the the recommendation slide i i i guess i don't want to want like kind of lose sight of kind of glad we looked at everything um the what inspired this study was the death of the gentleman at the crosswalk at marengo and maple right and so um i don't want to lose sight of you know that we're i hate to say the word scope creep but um i want to make sure that we um are proposing things hopefully systemically that can that are going to have an impact on reducing the likelihood of that occurring again um and so really focusing on um, very speed reduction measures throughout the street. Um, I like that we're considering the speed hump policy again. Um, also, uh, I, I understand in the future you're gonna bring forward the a, re a revision to the quick build curb extensions, right? With the slow streets, like maybe there's some things that we can look at like short term that will, that can provide some sort of um, traffic calming benefit at intersections like as far as like building the infrastructure um or build i guess building a narrow street and narrow inter intersections that are gonna make the street safer than pedestrians versus um you know i you know the the double stop signs which i think are probably not going to, you know, if people are running stop signs today, they're probably going to run them in the future. I think those are probably going to have very, very low impact. So um, as far as this whole list of of things, if we had to prioritize ones, um, I would first prioritize so anything that's going to eliminate severe conflicts. That would probably be the top priority. The second would be speed management. So I would prioritize anything such as um like raise speed humps or anything that are going to reduce the travel speeds, especially between Alhambra and um, Huntington Drive. Um, last, my last priority would be kind of just your run of the mill warning devices, like your hmm. your um, feedback uh, signs. your 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 feedback signs or your flashing lights. You know, I think that those are really going to have you're the 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 lowest impact. So um out of this entire list, I would prioritize um any sort of intersection tightening as well as um raise raise devices. Um I've noticed on also at Maple and Marengo, um I used to bike home from work that way. So I'm very familiar with it. The um the current stop sign, you had the bike lane, then you had the parking lane, and then you had the stop sign. If we could, if there was an op an option to tighten that intersection or bring or bring out that with like a bulb out or something on that T intersection sign, then it would allow us to bring that stop sign out, which would improve some visibility of it, or at least like as you're going up the street, like let people know that they're approaching an intersection. So I'm I'm yeah, hoping that, that 
that out as yeah that, as an that's idea. Really, yeah so then we talked to the consultant about particularly when they saw we had done on Marengo and oak i think the concern there was because of the prominence of the bike um corridor on Marengo and mm -hmm. the number of folks that use it that we have to do that in, in such a way that didn't you know cause a conflict and passage that way mm -hmm. so it's it's a tough one to mm -hmm. accomplish yeah um but yeah you hear you on that yeah that felt more like an intersection and less like a a mid-block segment because i think on the right side you don't see the it's a t intersection right so mm -hmm. you know if you're on the right side it just kind of feels like you should go straight right um and then also um at the intersection with huntington um you have a through lane and do you have a i don't think you have a dedicated space for cyclists to wait there i think you you have a very wide a wide lane and people kind of sneak up and do that right the yeah okay. the bike lane just basically comes all the way almost all the way up to the right because i i remember block. when when i when i would wait at that signal it was kind of stressful because people would come up behind you and they'd be like move right. and you're like well, yeah this is where where do you want me to go? And you, you have to go in front of the vehicles and well and wait and wait in the crosswalk. And so one thought we had is that if we do want to do that, um, you know, this we did it. The city did an evaluation on this a few years back, and yeah. it was really kind of um, there was it was basically inconclusive. Was you know utilization of bike boxes, mm -hmm. right? Um, especially if we did the offset. Yeah. On well, the, I mean. Yeah. I I don't know the community support for this, but right. would there be support for just closing that off, that right turn off? And oh, uh, at Huntington, on on Marengo, when you head north on Marengo and people cutting through to make a right turn on Huntington, it's so wide now that you know people they go around that vehicle waiting and make a right turn. Oh, I just see. What get you rid of it, yeah. and then they you know if they want to make a right turn, they're gonna have to wait until if they want to make a right turn on red. And they're the second vehicle. They'll have to wait till the signal turns green. No, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, and I'm, that uh, would go for the same for southbound as well. Too is it pretty? Or would you want a no right turn from south onto Huntington too? I, I think, you know, ultimately we. <laughs> I mean, hear, I mean, if you're talking about the bike, feedback, but, the bike, but I'm, I'm talking about like, just de deterring people from cutting, you know, from from cutting through there. Of course, it's a signal, it's a capacity yeah. issue where that acts as a right turn lane, um, but it provides a very efficient way for people to kind of head north and, and get on Huntington quickly. That yeah. if it were closed off, perhaps people they might not use that route as much if they knew they got yeah. to that signal and they couldn't make a quick right turn. I mean, I think to Ted's point, and I mean, I'm, I totally agree with all mm -hmm. of the points that you just outlined, but in it, and I would just add to it of, in bring up what you had said earlier is that this consultant is mainly data orientated and about collecting data. And I feel like their recommendations, um, like I would almost want tool to weigh in on the data that's here and give their recommendations from a planning perspective with the goals that we had brought this to like to fruition because of pedestrian and you know pedestrian bike safety to make our streets more safe it feels like some of the recommendations are to lessen tr like car car to car collisions more than car to pedestrian or making the streets necessarily safer for walking or any other mode other than being in a in a car uh, and they they still also feel like they have um, throughput in mind too and that it's not like we're not getting any of the suggestions like what we're talking about here roundabouts and you know cutting off cut through traffic yeah and and we we didn't necessarily expect that I mean we we wouldn't we would go a different pathway for the design of a project than this like this is really like again this is in 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 looking at how say funding off funding ju justifications go like without a i've written plenty of grant applications and just like sort of describing the problems and what you would like to see it doesn't really go anywhere you need to have some backup for it so we really wanted to have like Mm -hmm. you know justifiable data yeah. and a report that we could utilize yeah, yeah not to say that this would be okay what do you want to make out of this um it's really that's just that first step 
Yeah, so that's yeah. A, a, so I think a it's a comment. first step. Yeah, it's great to see all this data, but like I, I wouldn't. I would like to do a follow up step on as far as the recommendations of us seeking kind of other opportunities. Because I mean, just looking at the one of their recommendations of removing part of the bike lane. I mean, that's one of our problems in our cities having connected bike lanes or disconnected bike lanes, and and that that is a throw. That's a route that is to connect schools. And so it doesn't, you know, seem to improve safety for for the cyclists in that. Sure. Area. So I, yeah, I mean, in their in their view, um, again, a limited and I don't want to say a short view, but like looking at okay, how do we accomplish this sort of offset vehicle thing? Oh, we have to remove the bike lane. Whereas there might be some other ideas. Yeah. So I think a design, you know, an actual design firm that we would. Um, want to engage for, uh, say, the 2025 striping plan would be a bit different than this. So, um, yeah, we wanted to present the results of it. Recommendations are what they are. We didn't influence them. We discussed them. Um, but we certainly have, you know, different ideas also on this. So I guess what are the short-term thing? Oh, sorry. Oh. Are we going to go on? Sorry. I've been waiting. Yes, please. Please. That's okay. Why don't you go and then? Yeah, I had uh, Mr. Two two comments, um, and I didn't mean to hit this. <laughs> my my uh, hand just dropped. Um, I had two comments: one regarding uh, school pedestrians, mm -hmm. and I don't know if data was collected to show the number of school pedestrians crossing at Rollin and Marengo in the morning. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the traffic controls next to Marengo Elementary School. We have an always stop at bank, but that's not the main entrance to the elementary school. Rollin is. And at Rollin, we don't have stop signs on Marengo, which mm -hmm. I don't quite understand. We've got yellow crosswalks, crosshats, crosshatch crosswalks, a, um, a crossing guard. We've got the in pavement panel that says yield to pedestrians and crosswalk. We've really put a lot of traffic control devices out there, but I don't quite understand why that intersection does not qualify for a stop. stop being the main entrance to the elementary school. And I think that's something that should be looked at. Again, a block north, you have bank, which is not the main entrance, but it has the always stop. So I, I'd like to see I'd like to see that looked into a little bit more. Maybe there's a reason that. Um, Isn't that is... because I used to live on Rollins Street, so I'm aware, like, because Rollins dead ends to the middle school. It's not a through street. So it, even though it lines up with the elementary school, it is you you can't pass through east west or, or west west of the Marine. You're talking about Rollins? Yeah. Rollin goes to uh, Fair Oaks, correct? No, it it dead ends into the middle school campus. When they did the remodel, they capped But I, I think the key thing here is not the number of vehicles going east-west, but the number of children crossing um, is, Marengo. So you'd have to ask access through, you'd have to cut through the middle school campus, um, which is gated, to get to Rollin Street from Fair Oaks. And there's no other... Uh, T or other access point. So it's 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 literally like a little dead end block. So so I think your so, point so would there be aren't that. any children crossing there? There there are children crossing from that like area or you know, like when I would, you know, for summer school and I would drop my kid off at middle school, then I would cut through and then take my daughter to to up to Marengo. But there's just a much higher traffic at Bank and Oak because it's not a through street. So there are more children crossing Marengo at Bank rather than at Rollin? Is that what you're they saying? Still, they still will cross at Rollin. They'll go up, you know, but they'll, the, it's a feeder, you know, it's like it'll go from Oak up Marengo. So then that dissipates whether they came from east or west. Then the ones that came from the west side from Fair Oaks up Oak, from Oak onto Marengo, then will cross often time okay at so Rollin. you've probably got the answer and the knowledge of it i don't yeah. but is the crossing guard at a uh, or at bank it's at both 
or wait, no, there's a one at Rollin and there's one at Oak. I'm not sure if there's one at Bank as well. So I, I think um, I think the point you're making is that you're not necessarily looking at this as like a volume warrant evaluation. It's more of like a that subjective review of the intersection and the fact that there are there's a school there and that there are children. Might, right, just might look at the sense. number across. Yeah, them. I mean, um, Commissioner Hammond has personal knowledge of it, which I don't. But I just think uh, we need to know how many children are crossing. I think it's an interesting comment. We didn't consider that, so I, yeah. it's definitely worth consideration. Um, the other location I wanted to go to is at the Marengo at Huntington regarding the bike lanes. I've always been a little concerned that the bike lanes are dropped on the approaches to the intersection or on the departures uh, because it was felt that they couldn't fit in combination with the parking and the left turn lane. Now on uh, Marengo at Huntington, of course, you've got two approaches and you got two departures, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. North-south approach, north northbound and southbound approach and departure. Um, you have red curb on three of those legs, or three of those approaches or departures out of the four. And you could put red curb on the fourth one, which is on the east side. It, I don't know if you can go to it, but on the east side of Huntington, north of the intersection, there's an apartment building. And normally with apartment buildings, um, it is not considered absolutely critical that they have uh, parking in front of their um, building. As you go on the uh, southbound departure, southbound on the west leg or west side, you have an apartment building that has red curb along half of it, but for some reason not to the other half. You could take it all the way to the alley. Where I'm going with this is that I think it is possible to have the bike lanes be continuous through the intersections, northbound and southbound, with maybe only a little addition of red curb and maybe some creative um, striping where, you know, if you've got to use a 10 foot vehicle lane, okay, you go to 10 feet instead of 11. Uh, if you have a bike lane next to the curb, you need five feet, but if it's not next to the curb, I think the design manual allows you to go down to four. I think it's important that, that the bike lanes be continuous and I think it is possible to do, and I, you know, would be glad to work with any one of your staff to, you know, look at a the striping plan you have and figure out how much room you have and how much red curb might be necessary to to be added. But I think if we did it creatively, it it would be possible to um, allow the bike lanes to be continuous through the intersection. I don't like to see them dropped. It puts, you know. Uh, bicyclists in jeopardy, especially student bicyclists going to and from the school. I'd like to see us take a close look at that. Now, maybe if we did, we'd find, oh, um, can't do it. It takes away parking in front of three of the houses, and that wouldn't, you know, uh, be very welcome. But I, I think if, you, if we did take a close look at this, it, it would be feasible to do. Uh, in other words, take away a little bit of the parking in front of the apartments and um and do some curb and creative yeah. uh, striping that's helpful thank you thank you commissioner fisher um yeah sorry no thank you danielle do we want to take public comment and we can come back to discussion we don't hold anyone yes chair hmm. do we have any public comment on this item we do have two in-person public comments thank you first in-person public comic michael sloss please join us at the podium Chair, I have it set at three minutes. Thank you for your patience tonight as well. We appreciate you waiting. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. First of all, what I'd like to see is physical improvements to improve the safety of the pedestrians and the uh, people walking with their dogs, people coming in and out of their driveways, and also I'd like to comment on the uh, bicycle lanes. 
What I'd like to see for the bicycle lanes is moved inside of the parking area. That way, that would provide a buffer between moving traffic and people in the bicycle lanes. Maybe some small infrastructure there to like a small curb so the cars would know when they're intruding upon the bicycle lane, they hit that curb first so they would park outside of there. I like the idea of the roundabouts and the speed bumps. That's going to slow traffic and calm traffic. Absolutely. Doesn't depend upon a police officer being there to enforce violations. Doesn't depend upon uh, somebody's judgment as far as how fast they're, they're, uh, they're, they're going. They're going to know how fast they're going when they hit that bump. I traveled extensively uh, right out of high school going up to the mountain areas where the thing that was most important was the safety of you driving your car because if you didn't abide by the speed limits, if you didn't drive within reason, you drive off, off the side of the mountain, which you don't get a second chance. Okay, got a couple more minutes. <laughs> You're doing great. We appreciate your comments. Uh, one of the other things is the lighting on the street. Uh, the lighting on the street for especially evening and nighttime needs to be improved because it's very difficult to see people in the roadway, especially around Maple at the uh, Maple uh, Marengo intersection. Um, that would help a great deal as well. And I think I've covered just about everything. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next public comic, in-person public comic, is from Kay Maradian. Oh. <laughs> Certainly. And your yes. name? Good evening. Thank you for being here. Of course, thank you for all being here this evening and for your commitment to the city. You know, it's it's a, a wonderful city. Our family has lived here since 1906 and has had multiple homes throughout the city. We currently have a home on Marengo. Michael is our neighbor. He is actually pictured in many of your um, slides because his house is right on the corner of Alhambra Road and Marengo. And so he's been very um, helpful in rallying the neighbors on the Alhambra side who have been in the same situation we have been, but it's just east-west versus north-south. So we found a lot of support in Alhambra and we found a lot of support from the new public works director there who we introduced ourselves to, invited to our home along with um, Ted. And they spent an hour, hour and a half watching uh, a parade of traffic violations. They saw two people engage in uh, an argument, separate times, fighting over who got into the intersection first, cars rolling around the corners, and then of course speeding. And we're all sitting out there. They have an audience and yet this behavior just goes on. So we've worked really hard to, to put together a group. We have about 75 people in the Marengo Matters group. We do a quarterly newsletter and we're doing emails to them regularly. We are very um, happy that the city of Alhambra, because we're right on that border, we need their support. And we know that they're putting in mitigation efforts. I just downloaded their report, which is almost 300 pages of what they're doing throughout the city that was just published, which I'll PDF to you, Ted, so you can see it because I think it's important that we understand what both cities are doing so that we're not, we're working together rather than against each other. So Ted's been a tremendous support. He's come out every time we've asked him to. We feel like he's hearing us, but we're the ones who lost our neighbor. And he was a wonderful man. Not only did he die, but his wife lost her caregiver and their daughter was severely injured as well. And we feel like we can't stand by and have this happen again. And that really galvanized everyone um, because we've all been enduring the growing traffic for a long time. 
So we're hopeful that you're hearing what we're saying and that you'll act. Because every day that goes by, it's another opportunity for another accident. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for your I comments. put together the packets that you got. Right. Thank so, you. and thank you. And there's a lot more. Is anything you want to share, please forward it to uh, the public works team and they'll get it to us. Thank you. We'll now open up any comments from Zoom participants. If you would like to make any comments, please raise your hand. There are no comments from Zoom participants. That be the case, then I'll close the public comment for this item and we can continue with discussion. Fellow commissioners, um, Commissioner Hammond, any other comments? No other comments, thank you. Commissioner Dunlap, any comments? Sure, um, Ted, um, understanding the safety concerns today, you know, seeing this, you know, Again, comprehensive study, thanks for doing it. Tons of recommendations, things like raised crosswalks, which are gonna take, would take years. Realigning the intersection, take years. Um, radar systems, long time to procure, install, train everyone, get it time. Are there, what are the short-term things that can be done on a sh sooner than later to systemically improve the safety of Marengo Avenue. I guess, are there anything, is there anything here that is that we can do in the short term instead of kind of waiting until your the pavement project comes forward? Sure, um, and a lot of that we've been doing already. So we, um, especially in the school area, and we, we wanted to do that before school started, but we started expanding that work um, is repainting um, the crosswalks, uh, the limit lines, uh, curbs. Um, we've added the reflector, additional solid reflected material to the stop signs, um, changing out the paddle signs. Um, we'll be changing out the school signs to update them. Um, a lot of uh, some of that work, you know, as far as signage and markings, has to wait till the street. Resurfacing project, we just don't have the capacity or even the equipment to do that um, mm -hmm. larger length striping work. Um, but as far as taking action on what our maintenance team can do, uh, we've been implementing that. So um, that's uh, something that we have um, tried to um, set up as a new standard for work. I mean, a lot of what our maintenance team does is respond to maintenance issues. Um, we're doing a lot of corrective work based on service requests. So to have a process in place where we're doing some more of the preventative work, especially, you know, leading up to school or leading up to holidays, uh, that's something we're trying to implement um, with our current team. Anything else that gets contracted is a bit of a longer process. Okay. I, it's, I, I know people push back on the delineators um, and they were like, they're ugly. We don't like them. They're ugly. Um, they, there's a safety benefit. And like I mentioned, you're bringing forward. Um, we're going to talk about the, what it looks to make the ones on Oak and Moringa more aesthetically pleasing. Um, is there any flexibility and if the, if there's community support expanding the scope of some of those to Oh absolutely. To those, I mean that, as soon as we have a new transportation program manager, that's one of my first tasks is, okay. to, is to complete that transition of the temporary equipment to the semi permanent equipment that we talked about. Okay. Um we just don't have the staffing capacity to pull that off right now because you're looking at it. So right. um but as far as like thinking about where we're seeing the highest volumes um, at Alhambra Road and, and Maple Street and the largest amounts of speeding, it might be possible to do something like that in the short term before your pavement project comes through. Um, possibly, yes. Yeah, certainly at Oak Street, because um, we had planned on doing that anyway. Um, Huntington. 
but I'm, I'm be harder. I'm thinking be harder. more like down at Alhambra Road. Yeah, also. I think um, that that'll really just require um, buy-in with Alhambra. You know, mm -hmm. everything is theirs, and I think we'll achieve that, especially with the community support that Marengo Matters is. is There's also for. a park there. Yeah, exactly. So um, I have yet to look at the plan that um, Barbara had mentioned, but I know they had been working on that for some time. They, mm -hmm. are, I talked about it with the last Public Works director. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what they have slated for that area and if we can build off of that and what the timeline can be for it. Yeah, I mean, and I'll wrap up my comments up in a second, Commissioner Fisher, but I, I think the main goal would be, you know, as people are driving on this straightaway, um, giving people, you know, with all the stuff there, whether or not it looks good or not, it gives people like an, a warning, like, oh, I'm approaching an intersection, you know, mm -hmm. like I should change my behavior here. Oh, I might've missed a stop sign. Um, candidly, I ran a traffic signal a few weeks ago. I did not mean to run the traffic signal. I just accidentally ran it. You know what I mean? And I, I don't think that makes me a bad person. You know what I mean? It was a total mistake. So um, mistakes happen. So anything like that that we can do um, that might give people like a visual cue. It's like, hey, this is an intersection. Pay a little closer attention and stop or slow down. I think it's positive. Yeah, absolutely. We we absolutely support those types of improvements. That's why we launched that program the way we did. Commissioner Fisher, any other comments? Yeah, thank you. Um, when we talk about speeding, if we believe there's a speeding problem, and I'll be honest, I'm not clear there is. Uh, they're traveling at 29, 30 miles an hour. But if, if we collectively believe there is, have we had any discussions with the police department about either deploying occasionally a speed trailer or enforcing it through conventional means before we consider um capital improvement type uh, changes to the street and they and they do um even the day that we were out there uh um one of the enforcement officers was on site and he had he had quite he issued quite a few citations um uh but it's it's just that as as you would expect it's limited because of you know timing and resources so uh that I have seen the trailer out of Marengo here and there. Um, and yeah, we do have enforcement um, here and there as well. I think it's hard to do it comprehensively um, just because of the limitations, but definitely a consideration. And, you know, obviously pointed out in the staff report as well. We found it kind of an obvious recommendation. So we didn't really talk about it too much, but um, did in, I did inform the police uh, staff that we had this report, what the findings were, I think that um, we have to continue working together and it's a shared problem to, you know, enforce and then follow up with engineering controls. Okay, thank you. And um, the unfortunate fatality that occurred on Marengo at Maple was because, not because of speeding necessarily, but because someone ran a stop sign, of which we saw the statistics, one, two percent, three percent run run them. But regarding the measures on Marengo approaching Maple, uh, it is 950 feet of travel from nearly 1,000 feet from Alhambra to Maple. Uh, one could get kind of uh, in a go mode. And um, was there any decision made or exploration of a measure that would advise someone on this 950 foot stretch that, hey, the first stop sign in city of Pasadena is ahead. Uh, have we considered um, an advance um, stop ahead sign for that? Was that considered? Yeah, that was um, in a, as a general recommendation. The consultant said that's a tool and the toolkit is to implement both stop ahead markings where they're non-existent and then also signage for some of those long stretches. So that is a good comment. So that's something that's being considered now? Um, yeah, I mean, we we are uh, considering everything. You know, our view on this is that we've got 
a current opportunity to do things that are low cost and our staff can install. And that's something that we could do in house. Okay. Then we've got, you know, the second opportunity, which is uh, in 2025, where we have an opportunity to restrip the street. And then obviously additional opportunities are the projects we already have on the books and then anything else we can get funding for. Okay. And, and I would support seriously considering that in that, you know, it's a long stretch until you uh, come to the intersection. Also, there's a uh, stop payment marking on the at the northbound limit line, but it looks for crosswalk, but it looks quite faded. And and looking on Google, uh, it looks like it was probably installed maybe around 2016, and perhaps has not been maintained or repainted and. I think that's something you could look at again, just to wake up the, the driver. Um, having said that, uh, you've collected a lot of data for this um, study, type of data I hadn't seen before. So I congratulate you on, on looking at that. Um, but I support what others said that we should look at the short term measures that, uh, that would improve it rather than the bull belts and race crosswalks and those types of things. I think they could provide more immediate benefits more quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I would concur with my fellow commissioners if we could do some things quickly to show that one, that we are committed, which we all are, to the safety um, of our streets and the importance of focusing again on the pedestrians, the bicyclists, the other modes of transportation, just vehicle. But I, I think to the, the delineators, I think that's something we can explore. I do think upgrading our painting. I think the stop ahead was going to one of the things I was going to suggest as we look at maple. The other is for us to look at our lighting and our tree trimming, which we can do pretty easy. And maybe we do, because we do have a tendency in some of the older um, lighting fixtures that we've, we haven't upgraded them yet to LED or um, high, more high intensity. We can tell which ones as you drive through, which which have gotten that and haven't. So maybe we can improve the visibility, which um, our speaker spoke about um, and look at that street and see what we can do. But I think it's, it's also, it's important to look at next year, if we are gonna look at the street for substantial improvements, slurry seal or whatever, that we put together and we don't lose it off the radar that we then think about what other capital grant money, et cetera, can put forth if we are going to do this street as part of an improvement project. So that does, you know, so we take the time and we work on it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on the subject? Thank you, Ted. Okay. I think we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is our project status update. Thank you for giving us our thorough list. Um, we can go through. Sure, you know I can I can highlight a couple well, projects as we first, and then we can see if the commissioners have any, any questions, of course, issues or projects they'd like updates on. Sure. Um, so we are our next few. We, we're we're going to be releasing a few different bid packages in the next couple of weeks. Um, one is our pocket park projects. Um, our um. Our B project, our slurry seal project for 2024. And then um, later, a little bit later in the calendar year, we'll release the um, street resurfacing project that includes uh, those other streets that we talked about in our stream from and friend, which we call it project number two. Um, so our uh, we had applied for additional funding, as we talked about, for the Safe Streets for All program. Um, the Department of Transportation wanted to make sure that we didn't have like duplicative efforts with Metro and then the Southern California Association of Governments. Uh, so we had to do a couple rounds of back and forth with, uh, the, with DOT to make sure that we were all on the same page. We had to get support letters from um, those regional agencies so that we're all kind of uh, not overlapping in terms of the safety improvements we want to make. Um, so that uh, was a helpful effort. We've got good confidence that we'll receive that planning grant from SS4A, but we haven't uh, gotten word yet. Uh, the, re the referencing you just made to the project two and three is what we're seeing on the second page of our updated 
list, project list? Um, it's actually, yes, the second page, exactly. And then just a quick question. The numbers that we had here, um, reference to project costs, and I know there's references to funding. Are those current, and is that reflected in the capital budget plan that was just looked at by the city council? So uh, it's a good question. There's some nuance that answer. So the capital um, project funding is a five-year funding plan. So this is the year one funding. If you'd like to have an update on... Um, we don't calculate the um, actuals from this previous year just yet, as far as budget goes, to see um, what that new um, available budget is till uh, you know probably around October or so. But later in the year, if you'd like to understand how that is working, we can certainly add those details. I just was looking because I know I looked at the board agenda, it's looking at the numbers, and it was roughly for streets three million. Give or take, I believe was, was yeah the three plus. So that's and, still what we've got, right? And I was just trying to figure out how that would slice and dice to come back to correlate to make sure we've got and then know where the other fundings are, are, are cut, what the metro money, how that is, and how right. the safe, you know, safe. Uh, so we've we've spent about one point four of this. Okay. Um, but again, like how we we make last we make end of the year adjustments to preserve funding in different categories. So we like decide what is actually getting spent at the end of the year that just occurred in June. And then we basically look at all the numbers and kind of um, uh, update them to see what our, uh, we call it a, like our, we've got our carry over balance and then we make a mid-year adjustment. So then you'll see what our uh, CIP balance is towards the end of this calendar year. I guess it, what I allude to is things I know that have been discussed is one if if we proceed with the zone concept, then you need to we need to figure out how does that segue and you start for the funding to cover what you're going to need when you go into into the zone, but then you need to finish up the rest of the projects that are in the works that you had budgeted for that are carrying over because you've gone concept design bid construction etc. And they know that where's your start, you know, where's the funding then to be able to, because that's one of the issues. If we're going to do the zone, we know we need to have the adequate funding to cover the zone as it needs to be done. We have to phase that. We have to figure that out from a time standpoint and a money standpoint. Right. Um, so we'll be starting the zone designs uh, shortly. You know, we still have um, several projects that have to be designed and constructed before we even move into the zone process. Um, but you're right that that zone process ramps up the funding on an annual basis. So in the current, currently the city needs to put at least a million and a half a year of the general fund in just to fund the current program. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, as far as the Measure M project requests go, uh, we submitted the approved projects that um, the commission evaluated and the council approved. So um, uh, our consultant is working with the entire Joint Powers Authority to submit that information for approval by Metro later in the year. Um, some other updates. Uh, we, like I mentioned, we do have the final draft memo from tool design. We just got that. Um, and so our plan was to develop the, um, solicitation to bid the design work. And we're hoping to do that with our, um, we've got a comprehensive list of on calls that would submit a um, proposal for, um, the design priorities on Fremont Huntington. And so that's a item in our, um, work plan that we'll be bringing to you probably by October. Um, the sidewalk uh, ADA upgrades along Meridian, um, we've submitted the bid package to the Los um, Angeles um, County Development Agency as required for that federal funding. Um, and so once that package is approved, we can bid that project and improve those ramps on Meridian. We did have some changes. Um, 
For example, uh, you know, when you look at the plans, you'll see that a couple of different sidewalks, we basically had to add slight ball bouts to Meridian so that we would have enough space for the ADA ramp. Um, and then we had to remove uh, Braywood Court from the plans because it, it, the ramp, about halfway into the ramp is private property from that private HOA. And we weren't able to resolve um, that construction in time for the bid. So we'll have to just do that at a later time. We have the design ready. Um, the, uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, we did get the modeling results back for the Mission Street um, Slow Streets program. Um, and they, uh, Iteris did the modeling through our Alta contract. Um, so we're going to provide, we're going to summarize those conclusions and present them to the commission here in the next couple months so we can take the next step with that work. And Chad, on the slow streets, um, the actual furniture for the outdoor, is that, do we have a time frame? I worry about that sitting somewhere at deteriorating. <laughs> no, it's okay. We've got it okay. under control. Um, but yeah, our team... Um, has had a lot on their plate these last few weeks and we you know unfortunately continue to lose team members uh, to other cities so they understand that's a priority it just it just keeps putting push back the list you know among uh, water leaks and sewer leaks and um yeah. uh you know you'll notice all the catch basins in town are now covered for a study that we have to do so there's a, just a long priority we want to get all that painting work done on the streets on the the school so uh it hasn't been forgotten we're going to get to it the one thing to think about, and I will say this to the mayor, is that it gives us an opportunity when we put these this, these new furniture um, elements and design elements and pedestrian, you know, why we want to talk about them, the beautification elements, that gives us an opportunity to really build around it or have it go and time it with an event, like an art walk or, um, you know, some other city that we have this opportunity to to use that as a catalyst. So we should we need to make sure that we think about that and timing and get people built in and make it important because a lot of effort went into it and it's a great opportunity for us. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we we couldn't agree more. Of course. Um, last thing I'll mention I brought it up earlier in the evening we did receive the vehicle feedback signs that we ordered. Um, there was a long um, um, fulfillment on those, uh, but we our staff. Uh, was trained on the configuration of signs. They're actually pretty robust, um, their operating system. And so um, we'll be working with our team electrician to get those signs installed. Uh, I think it's two on Fremont and two on Huntington is where we've been, or we're installing them. Uh, any questions on specific projects? Commissioner Fisher, any questions? Commissioner Dunlap? No, thank you for the update, Dad. Thank you. No questions, thank you. I'm gonna break it and ask two. <laughs> One is you, um, the farmer's market bollards, you say it's a new project. Is that we're gonna be able to um, have different than the temporary K-rails who've been renting or is that, do I understand that correctly? So um, I what we did was we tried to change the status to that to a future project. We're just really not going to focus on that project at the moment. Um, if we can, if we can get funding for that project, uh, certainly we're um, pursuing funding for the entirety of Mission Street. Uh, we will look to implement that. So we put in our five year plan. What I want to emphasize is that there's really just not a whole lot of activity going on that project, nor can we really support that as a priority right now. So that's so we didn't want to take it off the list. I just want to emphasize that um, it's going to probably be deferred. And then the last two things: one was um, Ramona and the school since school started. Whether or not has the Holy Family have they they were going to look at their procedures any has that happened at all have we heard anything since we just started school yeah another lower priority this is really with our community development team right. um, as well to reevaluate holy family specific plan 
but um, if you've been to council meetings lately, you know the community development team hands are pretty full. So again, on our list, not forgotten, but not a, a huge priority at the moment. And the last one was you talk about the traffic impact analysis coming for 815 Fremont. Is there making sure that we can get in early on that on the look of that concept? Um, I know planning is going to look, and they'll need to do all of that. Well, we'll look. Likely not. Again, um, the, this commission and really no commission. Um, it, there's specific rules about which prevent us from um, doing these at a public evaluation. Really, we're just trying to be transparent and let you know what we're working on in this case. Uh, the, there's a, I believe there's a new developer at 815 Fremont, and the plan is just changing not too much, but slightly, uh, enough that it requires a um, new look at the traffic impact study. So we'll certainly present that study at a future uh, meeting, but not in such a way that the commission's comments would um, influence a review of the study, just because that's not um, how we approach these. Anymore. I think the one thing thinking is that you know, when we looked at the CAROs, the proposed and that there was a service entrance we were going to worry about. They were going to back up. It would back up into Mich the Mission Fremont intersection. So I'm, all I want to make sure is that we end up looking at some things that are not that are going to potentially be a real problem. Sure, so you know that. Some opportunities um, then to be able to say, wait a minute, this isn't this isn't a good a good placement. Sure, that wound up being uh, um, not an impact because it was um, off of Hope Street. And um, so, yeah, we are certainly concerned about um, impacts on Mission Fremont, and that's what the analysis will entail. Thank you. Thank Those you. Those are my questions. Next item would be the approval of our minutes. Does anyone have any changes, corrections, or additions? I I think the only change I have is public works is repeated throughout it. Like the header says public works commission. The last paragraph says public works commission. And then it's bottom says approved by public works commission. Oh, that's probably just an error. Just update the template. Yeah, it's just Thank a, you. kind of a template problem there. <laughs> yes. But no public works commissioners in that in there, just uh, the commission. Um, I'll entertain a motion for approval as amended. You would want to. I'll move to approve as amended. Thank you, Chair. We... I'll second. And thank you, Commissioner Hammond. Um, okay, Danielle, do you want to do the roll? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll now commence with the roll call. Uh, to vote to approve the June 13th, 2024 MTIC special meeting minutes. Commissioner Dunlap? Yes. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Hammond? Yes. And Chair Hughes? Yes. Thank you, Commission. This motion has passed. Uh, next would be City Council liaison comments. Madam Mayor, thank you for being with us tonight. My pleasure. Um, on August 1, I attended the Arroyo Verdugo Joint Powers Authority uh, Board meeting, and I learned from the presentation of our consultant, um, Cambridge Systematics, that um, this is the Measure M, South Pasadena funding allocation. The sub subregional total amount was $72,384,180,000. Um, and South Pasadena has a bit more than 5% of the total, which is about 3,681,333,000. Under the MSP, the uh, multi-subregional and regional plan, we received previous programming in the amount of 1,322,624, which included the Gravillia Street and Fair Oaks for 200,000, Pedestrian crossing devices for 322,624, and Columbia Street striping and signals for 300,000, and Orange Grove Avenue widening from Oliver Street to Arroyo Seco for 500,000. 
for the uh, year nine, the cycle nine, that this is for the uh, year 2025, 2026, we are receiving uh, $900,000 for the Mission Street Pasadena Avenue as to Arroyo Seco um, intersection improvement project. I think this is the corner, the, the complicated project, right? That leads to the golf course. And um, so a little bit um, of money helps, like we are getting 900,000 for that, but that's in 2025, 2026. And for the uh, cycle year 10, um, that's 2026 and 2027, we will be receiving 500,000 for the Garfield Monterey traffic signal and um, bike lane for 500,000. My um, concern is that what happens if the San Marino residents don't want the stop lights on Garfield and Monterey because part of it is the you know, San Marino district. So I don't know if if we could repurpose the project to some some something else probably just the bike lanes I, you know that's that's the public works director's discretion what to do with it and um lastly for um year 11 um the that's for the calendar 2027 2028 we have an unprogrammed um funding available in the msp in the amount of 748311 and there is an additional non-program SEP, that's a sub-regional equity program for um, 210397 So we're getting funding for the small projects that we have, which is pretty good. And um, possibly, this is just Measure M, so possibly we, we, we would like to have more funding from probably San Gabriel Valley um, Council of Governments. If we could get into their, their funding allocation, that would be helpful. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll do commissioner comments. Let's start with Commissioner Fisher. Uh, none, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dunlap. Um, no, thank you, Director Gerber. Commissioner Hammond. No comments, thank you. Well, I just wanna thank um, Ted for your presentation tonight and for putting it all together and also creating the uh, graphs or pulling the graphs or getting that because that was really, really helpful. And I think the data is really important and foundational to be able to show um, you know, statistics, what we're doing and build a foundation. So I appreciate that very much. So next, if there's any other comments from Director Gerber. Uh, just one I alluded to earlier in the evening. I we wanted to thank um... Vice Chair Zavala for all of his um, contributions. Um, he let us know graciously that he wouldn't be continuing on the commission, but uh, very much appreciated his advocacy and, um, you know, uh, being part of this volunteer group here that uh, helps guide our um, and advise our team. So, um, like I said, we'll we've already let the city clerk's office know. So we'll um, see if there's another recruitment that can happen for the, the um, that uh, spot on the commission. And uh, I think that we are all, always taking, the city's always taking commissioner applications if anyone's interested in that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we'll check and see if we need to do anything in the uh, interim for position, if there's some really ruling or thing we need to do. And it would be great to get someone on before we do that. Yeah, what I can do yeah. is um, I could find out if, uh, you know, what, um, it, uh, the, you know, the timeline for our appointment, if that seems to be kind of far out, maybe we'll stat, we'll do a, um, a vote. If not, then we can wait till that person joins. Okay. Um, Ted, I could still appoint until December 31. So, oh, um, I see. I was wondering if, um, um, Larry Abelson would be available. He was outing when, when we had that bike lane saga, but now that we had reinstated that bike lanes, maybe he'll come back. I'll approach him. Wonderful idea. Yeah, because he's very valuable to our... Um, never say never. <laughs> yeah, never say never. <laughs> All right, with that, I will adjourn the meeting and thank you, everyone, and please take some cookies <laughs> at 8.52. <laughs>